Good evening. It is our custom here to ask you to stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance in honor of the men and women who wear the uniform of this country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Mrs. Cheney, Mr. Vice President, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. For those of you that I haven't met, my name is Joanne Drake, and I am currently the Chief Administrative Officer at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. I'm privileged to call this my 30th year with President and Mrs. Reagan. It hardly seems possible. Before we begin tonight, uh, I want to take a moment to introduce the Reagan Library Director, Duke Blackwood. Now, I suppose for most of us, being the spouse of a former Vice President of the United States would be the lead line in any introduction, but not for Lynn Cheney. For her, it is almost a footnote. Now, I don't say that to diminish the office of the Vice President but simply to call your attention to Lynn Cheney's many achievements, one of which is to be the only second lady of the United States who had ever appeared on the list of those seriously mentioned for the vice presidential line on a national ticket. She might have gotten that tap too, had it not gone to someone else with the last name of Cheney. <laughs> Lynn Cheney's achievements are of course remarkable. Holding a PhD in English literature and author or co-author of 15 books, books for both adults and children. She served as President Reagan's second chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. She continued in that post under President George H.W. Bush. After leaving the endowment, she founded the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, which is devoted to reform of American higher education. If that wasn't enough, in the mid to late 90s, she was co-host on the Sunday edition of the popular television program, Crossfire. Only after all of that did she serve as second lady during the George W. Bush administration. In that role, she kept national attention focused on the matter of violent and salacious material in contemporary pop music and video games. Over the five years since she and the vice president exited formal public life, she has, among other thin things, been working on a book which brings me to why we are gathered this evening, to discuss that book, an already widely praised biography of our fourth president, James Madison. Asked recently what drew her to write on Madison, Lynn Cheney replied, now these are her words, the enormity of his accomplishments. She explained, he's the father of the Constitution, the architect of the Bill of Rights, the founder of the first opposition party in America, Secretary of State for eight years, and our fourth president. He was also commander-in-chief in the first war under our Constitution. So he has these enormous accomplishments, and I think is totally underappreciated. Reading that assessment, it occurs to me that James Madison, our most height-challenged president, by the way, was at the opposite end of the presidential yardstick from six-foot-four Abraham Lincoln. But if short in height, our lecturer this evening has shown that President Madison was a giant in all other respects. But before I introduce our guest speaker, I would be horribly remiss if I didn't mention how privileged we are to have with us tonight a man she has known since middle school and with whom she will celebrate 50 years of marriage this coming August. Yes. As you all know, He's not much of a slacker either. And it turns out he's not just tagging along tonight. He is going to serve as the host of this evening's conversation about one of our nation's founding fathers. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, Lynn Cheney and her roommate, former Vice President <laughs> Dick Cheney. Introduction ever. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well done. Okay. 
I think we're going to move this up. How do you hear? I think you start. <laughs> oh, that's a major concession the right there. Well, I, I thought I'd begin by explaining why it is we're here together tonight and why it is we're going to celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary soon. Um, in 19... 54, I was 13 years old living in Lincoln, Nebraska with my parents, <clears throat> and uh, dad was transferred. He had a choice whether he went to uh, Great Falls, Montana, or Casper, Wyoming, and he picked Wyoming, Casper. And in Wyoming, uh, I met Lynn, and uh, we grew up together in high school, went to high school together, and, um, and eventually married, obviously, and, you know, after 50 years. But I said the other night to a group of people, I explained that if my dad hadn't accepted that transfer to Wyoming that uh, I would never have met Lynn and she would have married somebody else. And she said, right, and then he would have been Vice President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. That's a great story. Well, the... Uh, I have some jokes I can tell at your expense. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's a special privilege for us to be back here at, uh, at the Reagan Library. Um, I had, uh, I came through here looking at the pictures recently after I did my, uh, my own book, uh, my memoir, I guess it was uh, in 2011. It was a picture downstairs, which is why I can remember. And uh, it's a tremendous facility and it, it's always been, struck me, and I'm on the board of the Ford Library and Museum uh, obviously involved with both Bush libraries. Uh, I'd have to say this is my favorite in terms of the setting. They're just a phenomenal job that's been done to, uh, to pay uh, honor and, and respect to, uh, to President Reagan and, and Mrs. Reagan and all that they represented. When uh, the president was in office, I was in the Congress, uh, but I was part of the leadership for the eight years he was there, so I had the off time frequently. I had the privilege of being part of the group meeting with him and it's always a very special privilege to, uh, to remember those years and the tremendous leadership he provided our country. James Madison. Um, I'm, you know, there were a number of founders that you might have picked, but you really zeroed in on, on James in particular. Um, why do you suppose he wasn't given as much rec recognition as the others had been? Mm -hmm. you, you said he was underappreciated but uh, clearly he had a, a remarkable a mar remarkable history. You know, I've wondered if one of the reasons isn't because he was short. Um, truly, uh, Madison wrote late in his life, um, after Washington died, it was not late in Madison's life, but it was after Washington had died, he wrote an appreciation of Washington from whom he had by that time become somewhat estranged. But he wrote an appreciation of him that talked about um, how uh, his natural modesty, and, and Madison valued modesty greatly, how Washington's natural modesty uh, combined with his elegant stature had uh, made him a great leader. And I wonder as I read, I wondered as I read that, um, if that wasn't Madison, you know, thinking to himself, it's sure easier to be a tall guy. <laughs> So I think that was part of it, um, perhaps. Um, he was also, as I say, he praised modesty in Washington, and Madison himself was a modest man. If he were alive today, he wouldn't be elbowing his way to the front of the crowd to get on the television cameras, you know, to, uh, to sort of uh, push himself, push himself. Um, he would rather have acted behind the scenes, floated ideas um, anonymously, uh, he knew enough not to speak out before the situation had un unfolded. He knew enough as a very young legislator uh, not to uh, uh, say everything that was on his mind in front of all of the senior legislators who were present. So in many ways, his natural reserve, I think, has made him uh, perhaps less interesting to historians than more uh, flamboyant figures like Alexander Hamilton, for example. I got my PhD in literature, as, as you kindly mentioned, and in literature one of the great questions people debate has to do with Milton's Paradise Lost. And the question is, why is the devil more interesting than God? 
And I, you know, I think that it, it speaks to, you know, our natural curiosity about the people who are just a little naughty. Um, you know, that, that's the story that uh, intrigues us more. You don't find that in Madison. Uh, he was a man uh, whose virtue was never questioned, unlike Jefferson's and unlike Hamilton's. Um, and, and so maybe that's made him a little less interesting. I think his virtue is something he should be valorized for as his remarkable intellectual accomplishments. He and Jefferson were the, certainly the two brightest founders. I think maybe two of the brightest minds of the 18th century. But um, Madison uh, used his intellect in, in less uh, conspicuous ways. So that might have something to do with mm -hmm. it. I was always struck, and I think it's one of the major contributions in your book, that, uh, that the tremendous um, accomplishments were based in part upon just plain old hard work. That yes. When it came time to, to um, write a constitution, you know, the expert in the, in the hall was uh, none other than James Madison. Can you talk about that, his preparation for that process? He was the hardest working of the founders. There's just no question about it. And by the time the Constitutional Convention um, opened, began, um, he had been studying uh, government and how past governments had fared, how republics in the past had failed or succeeded. He'd been studying those topics for years and very intently for a year. He arrived at the uh, Constitutional Convention before anyone else from out of state. And he did so quite purposefully. He had concocted the plan that he sh thought should be the agenda for the convention, but he was such a smart politician. He knew if you arrived at the convention and said, here's the agenda, the plan would go nowhere. So he used the time to greet delegates as they arrived from other states, to talk to Virginia and Pennsylvania delegates in particular, and bring them around to agreement that what came to be called the Virginia plan uh, should indeed serve as the agenda for the convention. So, you know, it was uh, an example. I think he's a perfect example for kids of how hard work pays. There was nobody who worked harder. And as one of his colleagues at the convention said, no one who was better prepared um, in the debates that uh, took place that uh, summer in Philadelphia. What was the most contentious issue they had to resolve as they put the Constitution together? Which one stands out as the most significant? You know, I almost hate to tell it because it will make your eyes glaze over. It was large states versus small states. You remember you learned that in school? But it was really interesting. Uh, somehow I think schools fail us in uh, not really conveying the dramatic interactions of historical figures. And certainly in that debate, um, it isn't conveyed. Madison was convinced, and he used words like this, which you, know, you don't find in the history books. He was convinced that the states were evil. He called them the wicked, evil states. And this because they um, were out of control. You know, there was, under the Articles of Confederation, which was our governing document before the Constitution, the states um, had ultimate authority, really. No one could stop them from uh, producing money, coining money, printing money. Rhode Island was especially good at that. Um, Madison called it Rogue Island. Um, it, just churn out money whenever you had a debt to pay. And you all know what the result of that policy is. It creates inflation. And as inflation is created, the money becomes uh, worth less and less. And so merchants were uh, hesitant to take this newly minted money and, and the inflationary money that resulted to take it in payment for debts. So Rhode Island passed a law saying they had to. Um, it was a way of, um, of preferring uh, debtors to people who were owed uh, debts. Um, there was also suppression of religious minorities. The states conducted their own foreign policies. Uh, they practically went to war against one another over you know, who got the right to tax whom for uh, using what ports. There was a, an insurrection in Massachusetts <coughs> called Shays Rebellion, where farmers had been taxed so heavily that they decided to shut down the courts so that nobody would have to go to jail for not paying debts. It was a mess, and uh, Madison um, wanted there to be control over the wicked states. So he arrived at the convention convinced there should be proportionality. People should be represented in the Congress according to the number of people in the states. 
that didn't fly with the smaller states who had long been represented by state in the Articles of Confederation. Every state under the Articles got one vote. So that was the big fight. And uh, Madison didn't get all he wanted. He was very troubled at the end of the convention. He honestly thought it might not work, that the Constitution might not work to uh, provide the stability that the uh, United States needed. He, you know, there are lessons I, I sort of have extracted from uh, Madison. One is work harder than anyone else. But another is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the possible. And it took him, he was so committed to the idea that um, the proportional representation was right. It took him several days, but in the end, he decided that the Constitution was a miracle in the sense that human beings could probably not be expected ever to produce a document so fine again. And he became his most ardent supporter. So it was the big states versus little states, but let me tell you, it was really an interesting story and not the kind you get in the textbooks. Whatever made them think we needed a vice president? <laughs> Well, truth be told, they didn't think we needed one. <laughs> it was sort of, oh, you know, when you have a leak in a tire and you put a patch on it, that's kind of what the vice presidency was. Um, Can you shorten the answer a little bit? <laughs> well, it had to do with the Electoral College, which was the compromise they finally reached on how to elect a president. And... Um, the other alternative, you know, the one that nearly came to be was to have the Congress choose the president. And uh, as you kindly pointed out in my book, I note that if the Congress had been put in charge of choosing presidents, we would never have had Ronald Reagan. And we would likely have had a number of uh, House speakers uh, become president. Uh, but fortunately, um, it didn't go that way. Um, and the Electoral College um, was uh, based on the number of representatives and senators each uh, state had. You got that many electors. If you had three congressmen and two senators, you got five electors. And those five electors each got two votes. Well, the little states, the fight is still going on. Well, said the little states, this means that the big states are always going to elect their man. So a rule was passed that you had to, if you were an elector, cast one of your votes for someone outside your state. So this would give uh, away some of the advantage of the, of the large states. They could cast one vote for someone for Virginia, but they had to cast one vote for someone from another state. Now, the people at the Constitutional Convention were very uh, alert to uh, where advantages lie, lay, and so they said, well, you know, maybe people will start throwing that second vote away. You know the game. If you have two votes and you really want George elected, you cast one vote for George and you cast the other vote for Joe who doesn't have a chance so that George will uh, more likely be the man. How do you keep them from throwing the second vote away? Well, then the vice presidency was invented. You made the person who got the second highest number of votes vice president. So you can no longer just throw the vote away. The problem then arose, well, what was he going to do? <laughs> and, and this is true. You know, they worried that he would just get into trouble if he didn't have anything to do. <laughs> and, uh, and so they decided to make him president of the Senate. Well, that upset m many delegates. It, it upset two in particular, George Mason and Elbridge Gerry of uh, Massachusetts. Mason was from Virginia. And in the end, they wouldn't sign the Constitution in part because of the dangerous office of the vice presidency. They thought it dangerous to have a person who had one foot in the executive branch and one foot in the legislative branch, that that would somehow um, interfere with the, the balance achieved by separation of powers. So even in the early days, vice presidents were disregarded and thought dangerous. <laughs> but I believe Elbridge Gerry later accepted the position when offered. He did. Um, <laughs> And Madison was the one who offered it to him. I don't think that Gary um, was approached by Madison to sort of, uh, you know, give him a little nudge about how he'd been opposed to the vice presidency and now he was being offered it. I think he offered it to Gary because Gary was getting old at that point. And the Virginia presidents took care of one another. Jefferson appointed an old vice president, 
thinking that that would help clear the way for Madison. Uh, Madison appointed an old vice president, and Gary, by the way, did die in office, but Madison wanted to prepare the way for Monroe. But you're right, Elbridge Gary was perhaps less a man of principle than he might have been. Mm -hmm. One of the most important provisions, I think, too, and one of the key points uh, that you make in the book, Madison was the very first president to go to war under the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Very important authority, obviously, and, and power and responsibility for the president. Um, and that was the, the fact that that happened was, uh, was in part obviously shaped by the convention, the Constitutional Convention. Can you tell us about the, the and, and specifically by Madison, who uh, was always uh, on his toes and completely alert to where, you know, little changes in language, nuances here and there would make an enormous difference. So the proposal before the Congress was to give uh, among those powers, among the authorities that Congress would have, and they were limited, but among them was to make war. And Madison leapt to his feet and suggested, and it was approved, changing the word make to declare. And that was very important because that meant that the president would be the commander in chief. The Congress could declare war, but the president would lead the nation in a time of war. And uh, Madison understood uh, the danger of having congressional leadership in wartime. Um, because he had seen it uh, during the Revolution. He had been in the Continental Congress. And, you know, you just can't direct a war with a large number of people, and particularly people who are, you know, full of different interests and perhaps not as knowledgeable about the situation as they might be. They would say, okay, let's let Light Horse Harry Lee go north. You know, we know there's trouble there. And they'd write Washington and say, send him north. And then they would hear that Light Horse Harry Lee was getting a little too close to Philadelphia, where they were. And so they'd say, no, 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 bring him back here. You know, he's needed here. It was no way to run a war. Madison understood that and uh, made that enormous change with one word at the Constitutional Convention. How did he do as commander in chief? I mean, they did burn the White House while he was in power. <laughs> You know, I, well, and you remember when we took off from the lawn on 9-11, uh, uh, Dick and I flew off the South Lawn in a helicopter to head for an undisclosed location. But we could see smoke rising from the Pentagon. It was, um, you know, we were both, it was on both our minds that this hadn't happened since 1814, since um, the War of 1812. Um, and. Uh, but it was a time of great trauma for our nation. Um, Madison was as steady a commander in chief, I think, as we've ever had. Um, not only through that traumatic event uh, when the buildings of Washington were burned, and he, he had to cross the Potomac into Virginia. And as he traveled along the Virginia side of the Potomac, there's this remarkable description by the man who traveled with him of you know, how they would look over and see the flames leaping into the night. And then they would go into a valley and you, know, you could almost think it hadn't happened. And then they would come up again and see, see the flames. But he was uh, convinced he had to get back to Washington as soon as possible. British were just making mischief. You know, they, they departed almost as soon as they had burnt the public buildings. And so Madison uh, went back. He wrote to Dolly, he said, I'm going back, and I expect you to come back also, although I have no idea where we can put our heads. Now, there's where would they stay? Well, they did find a place, and, uh, and Dolly came back. She was very uh, depressed and sad. But Madison, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure because he was president, he knew he had to hold it together. And he went riding around the city of Washington. It was really a town. There were only 8,000 people. He went riding around the town of Washington and uh, heartening the citizens, um, raising their spirits. Um, he was said to be sickly, and we'll get into that for a minute, but he was, he was on his horse. He was 62 or three at the time. He was on his horse for 60 hours, you know, riding out to Bladensburg where the battle was, riding back to Washington. The city was burning, riding across uh, uh, the Potomac, uh, riding alongside the Potomac, uh, 
And it's such a coincidence. I mean, sometimes fate works in mysterious ways. He is supposed to have spent his first night almost across uh, Highway 123 where we live. We live on one side and uh, Salona is on the other side where I think he did stay that night. Um, Highway 123 is also called Dolly Madison Boulevard. So um, he uh, went back to Washington. He took control. Um, he kept his spirits and everyone else's up as best he could through some terrible defeats on land. But he was also enormously grateful to the United States Navy, which he hadn't thought was a good idea. Uh, you know, navies are expensive and they could, they could oppress the citizenry perhaps. But um, the United States Congress had agreed to build six frigates. I think we had maybe eight or nine by the War of 1812 warships. And they performed magnificently. Um, the famous battle, of course, is the United States Constitution against the British frigate, the Guerriere. And when the Constitution defeated the Guerriere, it was almost as though the world had been turned upside down. Because here was the American Navy with maybe nine frigates. The British Navy had well over 100 frigates. They were regarded as the most powerful Navy in the world, and our frigates were better. The Constitution was built of live oak, and when um, can cannonball were fired at it, it bounced off the sides. So that's why it was called Old Ironsides. And uh, the, the War of 1812, I think, has been as underestimated almost as Madison. It is a very, uh, it is an amazing event to read about. Mm -hmm. Madison <clears throat> accomplished uh, all that he did in spite of a significant affliction. And one of the major, I think, uh, contributions of uh, Lynn's book is getting to the to the bottom of, of that affliction, what, what it was and uh, how he dealt with it. Well, there were two things that struck me as curious. Uh, one was that he was so often described as sickly. And yet, you know, he was on horseback for 60 hours. He took a thousand mile trip with Jefferson, you know, I think carriage and horseback, another thousand mile trip with Lafayette. He regularly made the trip between, well, depending on where the national capital was at the time, Philadelphia or New York or then Washington, to Montpelier, which could take, you know, up to a week. And if it had rained, which it seemed to have rained all the time in the 18th century, um, you know, the, the, the river swelled, you couldn't get across, you had to swim your horses across. Um, I've often wondered if the people who've called him sickly could have accomplished even the you know, regular trips to Montpelier, but he had that reputation, despite the fact that he was so clearly fit most of the time. That was the first thing that was curious. The second thing was, I had read about, though it's never been published, but I saw a reference to a letter at Princeton um, in Firestone Library, a draft autobiography that Madison composed in 1816, the last year he was president, in which he said, Throughout my life, I have been subject to sudden attacks, somewhat resembling epilepsy, and suspending the intellectual functions. Now, he hadn't really been taken seriously before. That statement hadn't. He never actually, that was a draft autobiography. He never published it. But there it is in his teeny tiny handwriting that he had sudden attacks. So I decided to take him seriously. And I can see why other historians haven't, because it takes a lot of time to try to sort something like this out. I consulted experts, including a wonderful man at New York um, University, Dr. Oren Davinsky, and read 18th century health manuals until I thought my eyes were uh, going to be swollen shut. Um, they're, they're written in a kind of funny script and usually very tiny too. I think, and Dr. Davinsky uh, thinks, that he had complex partial seizures which is a mitigated form of epilepsy. It's uh, you don't fall to the ground and convulse um, as people who uh, have um, uh, grand mal seizures do. Uh, your intellectual functions are suspended. He gave a perfect description of it. You don't fall to the ground, but you can't understand what's being said. And if you speak, you, you're probably speaking in a garbled way. And it passes, but it can be very traumatic as you can imagine. And uh, 
I think that is um, the answer to what happened to Madison uh, that made people think of him as sickly. Because he was constantly, not constantly, he was often being, um, how shall I say, he had to drop out of the action for a while. He had to drop out of the action when he uh, trained to be a militiaman uh, in the Revolutionary War. Uh, he very clearly describes that event in a way that uh, makes clear he had some sort of seizure and he couldn't continue his military training. The other time he had one that was probably pretty conspicuous was at um, the Virginia Ratifying Convention. As people in a crowd like this know, after the Constitution was signed, it had to be ratified by the states. And one of the biggest and fiercest con contests was in Virginia. Uh, during that contest, Madison was in the middle of a speech and he excused himself and was gone for two and a half days. Um, and he later described what had happened to him then as a fit of sickness, a fit. So uh, it, it's pretty clear that that was also one of these um, seizures. Um, it makes me admire him all the more. You know, he, he uh, dealt with something that in the beginning uh, put him to, into a state of deep despondency. And uh, the first one happened while he was at Princeton, the first one as an adult. And uh, it left him very depressed, uh, morose, sad. He wrote letters to a friend of his from Princeton. In part, his sadness came from the fact that the orthodox uh, religious view of the day was that if you had epilepsy, you were evil. If you had epilepsy, you were full of sin. If you had epilepsy or sudden attacks resembling it, you were probably possessed by the devil. So this was you know, an awful thing for a young man of 20 years old to, to deal with. He finally did deal with it. He uh, talked to doctors who told him to exercise. And while that didn't prevent future seizures, it did mean that he was probably uh, better able to deal with them. And he was described as quite fit. Now this isn't a sickly person. This is a person who has a disorder that strikes him every once in a while. And I think that once he got his body in hand, so to speak, he decided to take his soul in hand. And uh, he said to himself, human beings have the perfect right to reach judgments for themselves. None of us should have to believe what other people tell us to believe. None of us has to accept as truth some idea that strikes us as false. And that was not only the key to him for overcoming uh, his disorder, but he became a fierce advocate of religious freedom. You know, you don't have to believe what someone else tells you about how you think about the world and about God. It made him a complete advocate of intellectual freedom and uh, freedom of conscience. That's, that's a phrase I think that describes it. We're all in charge of what we think the truth is and how we should believe. That was a really long answer. That was very good. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorites. <laughs> I, uh, we've talked a bit about Dolly tonight, but she played such a central role in his life. Tell us about, uh, about Dolly Madison. Well, Dolly was, she was beautiful. Um, there's widespread testimony to Dolly's beauty. Um, one of her friends said, or maybe it was her niece, that uh, men used to stop in the street when Dolly passed by. She had uh, dark hair. She was uh, tall for that time. She was maybe 5'8". Uh, dark hair, um, pale skin that she had learned as a child to, to uh, uh, shade from the sun, to shelter from the sun. Um, blue eyes, ruby red lips, you know, the whole package. And uh, when Madison saw her on the street, he was smitten. And so he went to a friend of his, uh, whom he'd gone to Princeton with, and asked for an introduction to, uh, to Dolly. The friend, and this is, this is so indicative of what a small world the 18th century was in the United States. The friend whom he asked for the introduction was Aaron Burr. <laughs> I know. Now, this was before Aaron Burr you know, went astray, but still. <laughs> Um, so he, he introduced uh, James to Dolly. She wore a mulberry red dress and yellow glass beads, and a few months later they were married. Um, she, she was not only beautiful, she had this great, warm, encompassing personality. 
Um, one of her early biographers said, Mrs. Madison loved everybody, and everybody loved Mrs. Madison. And it was an enormous asset for James Madison in that particular time and place. Uh, Washington, the, the town, was uh, very crude in the early days. There, was, uh, there were only a few houses, so congressmen and senators who came to town stayed in these boarding houses. You know, they're crowded, they're sharing beds with each other. As one of them said, we do nothing but talk politics from one end of the day to the next, and we're, we're feeling a little stunned like bears, he said. There was no, no entertainment, you know. Well, there was, one, there was one kind of theater you could go to. It featured rope dancers. <laughs> now, that's, that's all the description says. Um, and, uh, you know, I really wondered. I, I, I don't know, but I, I tell myself it was tightrope walkers. <laughs> So, you know, with that as the only form of entertainment, the, the best thing of all was to go to the Madison's house on F Street. Um, at, at, I'm talking now about the time he was Secretary of State. Um, this was um, between 1800 and 1808. You go to the Madison's house on F Street and Mrs. Madison, she had a very dramatic flair for dress. I think she thought of herself as entertainment. You know, she would show up in these outlandish costumes one was um, all pink, um, and it had ermine trim. It, uh, had, it was decorated with a numerous uh, gold chains and uh, some sort of Moroccan thing. Um, she, with it, she wore a big white velvet turban decorated with peacock feathers. Uh, so, you know, everyone, and she was so warm, and everyone loved seeing her. Everyone loved being greeted by her. Um, she made the congressmen and senators uh, feel good about what they were doing for a little while when uh, she would entertain. It, in those days, was a huge advantage for Madison because it was the Congress, the, the caucuses in the Congress, that picked the presidential nominees. So when it came time to pick a presidential nominee in 1808, as, as one senator wrote his wife, uh, because of Mrs. Madison, Mr. Madison has a great advantage going in. And indeed, he was nominated. So it is an example, I've often thought in my life, that I'm not sure that political wives make a whole lot of difference. You know, I think that if you're somebody who's bizarre, you might. Um, uh, but that on the whole, you know, people really do vote for the man. It will be a woman someday, and then we'll see if political husbands make a difference. But in, in, in this day, and not soon, I hope, in... Uh, <laughs> In Dolly's day, it made, she made a difference, and uh, that makes her story all the more important. But her story's just wonderful. There are so many parts of Madison's life that are just interesting to know about, besides his enormous accomplishments. Madison's were married uh, for 42 years. We will, as of August, have been married for 50 years. Would you tell us tonight what was the highlight of those 50 years for you? <laughs> Well, that's not quite as ancient history, is it? <laughs> oh, you know, I hate to say this in front of Dick, but it, it's been a really nice 50 years. It, uh, <laughs> I'm buying myself time to think here. Um, <laughs> well, well, let me go on to the next question. No, no, I've got, because I have an idea. Um, People don't know Dick Cheney the way I know Dick Cheney. Um, I know he's got a wonderful sense of humor. Well, you've seen some of it here tonight. He's pretty funny. But he's also a romantic. Now, now you didn't know this. The world thinks he's Darth Vader. <laughs> but so what I'm going to tell about is his uh, remarkable, uh, the remarkable time he threw a surprise party for me. I think he may have tried before and failed, but this was a huge success because it was so unexpected. The surprise party was for the 50th anniversary of our first date. Now, I know husbands in the audience, you're gonna have to top this. It's, uh, <laughs> and uh, we, he was vice president. We were living in the Admiral's house at the Naval Observatory. So he, you know, he had a, a great arrangement. He arranged for the party to be at the actual observatory. So there was nothing for me to see going on. 
And he very thoughtfully arranged a cover story. He told me weeks in advance we were going to the British ambassadors for dinner. Now you understand how important that is. So I would get dressed up, I would put on makeup, you know, and, and I wouldn't be at a surprise party uh, in my pajamas. Um, so he told me we're going to British ambassadors and um, that was all fine. I swallowed a hook, line, and sinker. And then there's this event in Washington called the Gridiron Dinner where politicians stand up and sometimes they're funny, um, sometimes not so, but they have a head table. And if you're the wife of the vice president, you sit at the head table. And right next to me, when Dick saw the seating at the head table, was a British ambassador. So he was sure I would you know, say something to the ambassador about coming to his house. And so as Dick explains it, I had to read him in. You know, this is an intelligence term. I had to go tell him, you know, what the, what the plan was. And the British ambassador carried off his part quite well. You surprised me enormously. And, uh, well, there are many nice things I could talk about, but that's a good one. That's not bad. <laughs> one more question. It's an, an important question, and then perhaps we can turn to the audience for some questions. Um, Madison's greatest disappointment. Oh. What was it that frustrated him most about uh, the, uh, well, his career? Well, it was, I'm not, sh I guess it was part of his career, but it was slavery. Um, he and Jefferson both hated slavery. They were very good friends. And this was one of the similarities in their life patterns. They both hated slavery and they both died owning slaves. And it was, a subject that, you know, Madison knew slavery was immoral. Um, they just couldn't figure their way out of it. Uh, part of it was that Madison had vowed in his early days to uh, find himself a living that didn't, uh, didn't depend on slave labor. Um, he depended on the slave labor at Montpelier uh, for his living. and. So he tried for a brief period, uh, investing in land, for example, to build himself a little uh, nest egg so that he could move away from Montpelier and establish that independent life. But then, you know, the revolution came along, the Constitution came along, and he, he never really spent that time trying to build himself an independent living. By the time he was retired, if you were going to free a slave, um, the slave had to be moved out of state. That was the law in Virginia. Neighboring states didn't want freed slaves, so they passed laws that freed slaves couldn't go there. Toward the end of his life, he um, threw himself into the project to um, establish um, a means by which freed slaves could be transported to a colony in Africa. It was called the American Colonization Society, and uh, Many of the great men of the 18th and early 19th century were part of it, like John Marshall. But they were all smart, and they knew this wasn't anything that would really be a solution. For one thing, liberated slaves didn't want to go back to Africa. Uh, the slaves at Montpelier had uh, lines there that went back as far as Madison's own family. They thought of Montpelier as home not of Liberia, which was the place that uh, the colonization society focused on. And there was no way to, to build enough capacity to, to free all the slaves and, it was, it, was, it was not a good plan. And I think Madison knew it, but at the end of his life, he just clung desperately to it. Just hoping he could manage somehow before his death to, uh, to mitigate this, this uh, terrible, terrible institution. But he failed, and I think that, I think he would have said that was his greatest disappointment. Final. <clears throat> so, One final thought. <clears throat> oh, um, sorry. He, he's off the reservation again. <laughs> he's the host. <laughs> the um, question of where you would rank him uh, among presidents. We've had, we currently have uh, our 44th president in office. Where would Madison fit in the overall pantheon of American presidents? You know, I have a hard time comparing any other presidents with the founders. You know, maybe Lincoln. It, it, they lived at a time, as Lincoln did, when we faced um, challenges to our very existence as a nation. 
Um, and so it was a time when you, you were able to accomplish great deeds that in uh, calmer times, perhaps you, you, you just didn't have the opportunity to do it. They, all of the founders uh, had read a, a man named Cato um, who declared that the greatest honor a man could achieve was to be the founder of a nation. And in some ways, that just sort of separates them. So I guess I would just compare him to the other founders. And uh, Washington is sometimes called the indispensable man. And I would certainly not rank Madison above Washington, but he was as indispensable as Washington. Without him, we wouldn't have had the Constitution, no Bill of Rights. Um, he was crucial to getting the first government underway. So I think he, I think he was more crucial to our lives today than Jefferson, um, certainly more than Adams, and clearly more than Monroe. So, you know, maybe right after Washington. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. <laughs> So we do have time for a few questions. You, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Someone will bring you a microphone. It's really important that you have the microphone because we're live streaming and you need to be part of the sound studio. So we're gonna start right here. It's an honor to be here with you and Mr. Vice President. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's, it's just a blessing to, to be here with both of you guys. Uh, my question is, uh, did uh, President James Madison have any children and did any of them go into politics? <laughs> Um, he, he didn't have a, a child of his own, but Dolly was a widow when he met her, and she had a two-year-old son, whom Madison then raised. This young man was as handsome as his mother was pretty. Um, he spoke French quite elegantly. He had traveled in Europe, became very sophisticated, and uh, he was a total wreck. Um, <laughs> He, he drank, he womanized, he gambled. Um, Madison was constantly you know, following behind and picking up the bills that Payne was his name, had run up. And uh, you know, he was a great disappointment to both his parents. In some ways, he's been a little bit of a blessing to those of us who, are, uh, who research these things. Payne used to support his bad habits by going into Montpelier and stealing things that he would then sell. The result is, if you ever are told by someone, I have a James Madison letter, you should pay attention, <laughs> you know, because it might have been, a lot of the letters kind of escaped that way. And while there are 30,000, uh, uh, 30 volumes of Madison writings, there are still ones out there. I found two. Uh, a friend of ours on the Eastern Shore actually had two Madison letters that were important. They uh, finished up stories that we'd only known the beginning of before. So that was a really good question. I appreciate your asking. Right here. Wait a minute, sir. Read for the microphone. Did the uh, uh, boy uh, wind up having children and their having children, Dolly's son that was really his son in the future that, you know, like, that would live on today as descendants. And were any of the items that were rifled uh, just too important to where it would be heartbreak since, since he was unstable, you know, having access to the Montpelier, the home, and to where the loss was too great and it was irreplaceable? You know, we, we don't know everything that was stolen. Um, so that's a really tough question uh, to answer. Uh, Payne himself, um, you probably won't be surprised to learn, died an early death. Uh, he died just a few years after Dolly died. So there are no direct descendants, but there is an organization uh, called Madison Family Descendants. Uh, Madison had six uh, siblings that lived to be adults, uh, five who died. You know, this is a typical story in the 18th century. But of those seven, uh, there are uh, descendants. And so there is a, an organization of the Madison family. Right over here. With the leaders such as Madison, why did the founders manage to avoid women's rights? That's a really good question. Um, I've wondered that. Uh, and not just the founders, but 
it took us well into the into the 20th century before uh, women's right to vote was uh, fully recognized. If you if you do a lot of reading in that period, you don't find many voices. Um, advocating women's rights. There's Abigail's, and that was a very important voice. You know, remember she said um, in a letter to him, be sure to remember the ladies when you're putting the new government together. But there just wasn't um, a great push for it. I think maybe having children, you know, and, and having 12 children as Madison's mother did wasn't unusual. Um, having to cope with uh, childhood mortality, which was uh, something I don't even know how psychologically uh, they were able to deal with it. Uh, having the primitive kind of household arrangements that they did, you know, there are no washing machines, for example. Maybe women just didn't have the time to be discontent about their rights. Um, I, I don't know. It is an amazing thing to me that it took so long for um, the idea of women voting uh, to take hold. We have one over here. Hi, since we're here in the Ronald Reagan Library, do you have a fond memory of President? Do you have a fond memory of President Reagan that you could share with us? Well, I was reminded tonight because the uh, Ronald Reagan Library organizers are so efficient that in the little room that Dick and I were waiting in until this event started, they had some pictures from uh, uh, when Reagan was president and Dick was in the Congress, and one was upstairs in the family residence. It was when the Japanese Prime Minister had come to visit, and uh, we were very honored to be included in this small dinner upstairs. I was especially honored because I got to sit right next to President Reagan. And, you know, it's so intimidating. You think, well, what am I going to say? So my key question is always the same. If you ever sit next to me at dinner, I will say to you, what are you reading? <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I said that to President Reagan, and he just calmly, you know, finished cutting his meat, and he said, I'm reading a really good book called The Ghost on Air Force One. <laughs> I don't know what this book is. I guess I should probably Google it now. But, uh, you know, there was no pretense about him. He didn't say, well, you know, I'm really reading Plato. Uh, <laughs> he said, no, no, I'm having a great time reading this book about the ghost on Air Force One. He, he, what, a, what a wonderful man. I'm going to assert the right of the host, yes. and I'm going to tell my story. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> favorite moment. In, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, about 1986, we were having a big debate over taxes, tax policy, and the president had sent up a tax bill that he wanted passed. The uh, Democrats controlled the House at that point. Republicans controlled the Senate. And the bill that came out of the Democratic Ways and Means Committee was a terrible bill. And the House Republicans didn't like it. And I conspired with some of my colleagues, uh, Trent Lott and Bob Michael and so forth. And we didn't want to vote against the bill, the president's bill, but we killed the rule so they couldn't debate it on the floor. And that upset the apple cart at that point. And we got a phone call from the White House saying the president would like to come meet with his wayward House Republican friends. <laughs> so the White House plan was to, no matter how bad it was in the House, we'd send it over to the Senate and the Senate Republicans would clean it up. But we didn't want to have to vote for a bad bill. Well, we made uh, time on the schedule for him to come up. But before that date arrived, there had been a terrible accident up in uh, Newfoundland. And a plane load of uh, troopers in the 101st Airborne were returning from a mission in the Sinai where they'd been on deployment. And the plane crashed on takeoff and they were all killed. We lost about 200 uh, troopers that day. And so the president went down to the memorial service at Fort Campbell, Kentucky and spoke at the memorial service. And then he came up, flew back to Washington, and we had the meeting that was previously scheduled with all the House Republicans, which was in one of the big hearing rooms there on the Rayburn building. And the president came in and uh, very solemn and uh, talked about that service down at Fort uh, Campbell. Talked about what it meant to be an American, patriotism and sacrifice. And it was a very, very moving moment uh, off the cuff as only Ronald Reagan could do and just captured the, the spirit of America. And uh, as soon as he got through speaking, there wasn't a dry eye in the room and it was very, very quiet. And then he said, now gentlemen, he said about that tax bill. <laughs> and members started jumping up saying, I'm with you, Mr. President. You can count on me, Mr. President. He turned around 70 votes. <laughs> 
in the meeting and went, took the bill back to the floor, passed the rule, passed the bill, sent it over to the House, and he, he got exactly what he wanted. It's a classic example of really very, very impressive presidential leadership. We have one right here. Uh, which of the amendments in the Bill of Rights do you think was the most important to, uh, to, uh, to James Madison? Probably the first. I mean, almost certainly the first. Uh, Congress shall make, make no rule to, uh, to abridge uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion, and, and uh, that, was, uh, that was deeply important to him. But curiously, that was not the First Amendment in the list he wrote for the Congress. Uh, there were two others in front of it, and I have never quite understood why, but there was um, one bill, uh, one amendment, the, I think it was the first one, was about capping the size of the House of Representatives. You know, if you continue to let the House grow in proportion to the population, pretty soon you have 5,000 congressmen. So that was the rationale for the First Amendment. The Second Amendment was about not letting congressmen pass a bill to raise their salaries during a term in which they were serving. And that one, that one didn't make it in Madison's time. It finally made it sometime in the 20th century, wasn't it? I believe so. Um, but then you came to the Third Amendment, which became the First Amendment. And it, it's sort of like, you know, the Lord working in mysterious ways, because I do think that was not on the most important Madison. It's the most important to most Americans. Okay, we have time for two more. I think there's one back here. Thank you. I just want to say that in my lifetime, I've always hoped that you would be the first family <laughs> at some point and have great admiration for you since, I, since you were Secretary of Defense, Vice President, and I just really admire both of you. But um, my question is this. Um, Madison had problems with the Constitution, as you pointed out, and I'm just wondering, of the, th of the amendments in the Constitution that were passed under him, um, what, is, what do you think his greatest misgiving about it was, or what was missing from it? I know that certain, like George Mason, did not, was not willing to sign to ratify, and other great, really, founding fathers did not sign. And I'm wondering what Madison was most concerned about. Well, he was concerned at the end of the Constitutional Convention, still, about the, the power of the wicked states. The history of the Bill of Rights, though, is very interesting, because Madison opposed having a Bill of Rights during the Constitutional Convention. The thinking was, and it wasn't just Madison, it was most of the delegates at the convention, the thinking was the Constitution didn't give away any of the rights of the people. It gave away certain limited powers to the government, but none of the rights of the people were turned over. So a Bill of Rights would be either, one, um, superfluous, you know, we didn't need it because we hadn't given over any rights, or two, kind of dangerous, because if you said people have the right to X and you didn't say they had the right to Y, then perhaps Y would be the object of suppression. You know, it, any list, if it weren't total and complete, would raise the question of other rights that uh, might be vulnerable to government power. So they didn't think there needed to be a Bill of Rights, except there were a few voices in the very last days of the convention, and George Mason uh, was among them. Madison quickly realized that after the Constitution was ratified, that having a Bill of Rights would be a way of bringing everybody on board. You know, you could bring the opponents on board. He was a political creature, though, and he also, by this time, there were two parties, um, not, there were two opposing parties at this time. There were those who wanted the Constitution and those who didn't. And Madison saw that by putting a Bill of Rights into the Constitution, you would just undercut totally the people who didn't, you know, by, by including this. And he also knew that if you wrote the Bill of Rights properly, you didn't run into this danger of anything not listed was vulnerable. And he thought he could probably ensure that they would be written properly since he would be doing the writing. <laughs> 
Um, and so if you look at the if you look at the amendments to the Constitution, they're curiously worded, but in a very purposeful way. Congress shall uh, make no laws that abridge freedom of religion. You know, it, it's stated so that Congress can't do this, but that doesn't imply that Congress can do that. So Madison very artfully worded uh, the Bill of Rights and uh, uh, fought against all odds to get them through the Congress. All of the people who had been on his side still didn't think they were necessary. Thought it was just a big uh, delaying thing when they had more important business. And the people who had been for a Bill of Rights didn't want those particular rights. They wanted things that, in fact, Madison had fought for. They wanted a Senate where there was proportional representation. Madison's getting the Bill of Rights through a Congress in the face of opposition from not only his foes but his friends was, I think, perhaps the most skillful political maneuver in the whole history of the Republic. Okay, we have time for one more question. If we can maybe go right here. While we're getting the microphone, I have a cheater question. I would like to know from both of you, which party, political party, you think James Madison would belong to today? <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not an easy answer. Um, but I think what I admire um, is his absolute emphasis on limited government. And that would certainly make him a Republican today. I agree. <laughs> and that's why they've been married for 50 years. <laughs> Sir. If uh, Madison was alive today, what kind of amendment would he pass today? Hmm. Well, you know, there has been an interesting movement on both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, Mark Levin, whom I respect gratefully, from, uh, uh, greatly on the right side of the spectrum, has proposed having you know, either a convention or passing what he calls liberty amendments. And now Justice Stevens, who's definitely on the other side of the spectrum, is proposing a whole series of amendments that he thinks are important, such as uh, you know, putting limits back on campaign financing. I frankly am scared to death of uh, you know, getting a group together to reopen the Constitution. Um, if we want one or two amendments, well then let's get them through the Congress, let's get them through the states, that's fine. But the idea of a second constitutional convention seems to me just like opening up a can of worms. So I think Madison would say, uh, you know, any amendment that people want, let them do it according to the process in the Constitution. But I just can't imagine his being in favor of a second convention after he saw how hard the first one was, especially. Well, uh, I hope all of you agree. It's like being part of a master class this evening. I think we uh, are so grateful to both of you, Mrs. Cheney, for the book, Mr. Vice President, for hosting this evening. And w Mrs. Cheney has agreed to sign the book. So if you don't already have a copy, I see a few people have already gotten theirs. We do have them available out here. We will do the book signing on the stage. So the beginning of the line will start over there. And we thank all of you for coming. I hope we see all of you on June 5th for the 10th anniversary of the president's passing.